we will chat a little bit more about the biology of the cell, probably start replication. I hope we should be able to finish it next Tuesday and start talking about metabolic processes. I want to sum up what are the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic gene expression in, again, really wide brush strokes. So in prokaryotes, which are black on the right, so translation immediately follows transcription, these processes are practically simultaneous. Remember that picture that I showed you a couple, couple of slides before, meaning that while mRNA is still being synthesized, it's already being translated, okay? Uh, this is possible because there is no physical boundary between the DNA and the ribosomes. And since there is no processing of mRNA, no splicing, no polyadenylation, mRNA is ready to go. In eukaryotes, transcription and translation are separated, both in time and in space. In space, by nuclear envelope, okay, mRNA that is synthesized in the nucleus has to be transported across the nucleus into the cytoplasm or endoplasmic reticulum of eukaryotic cell for further translation. In time, because there is mRNA processing, such as splicing, polyadenylation, which we didn't really talk about, capping, I really want to focus your attention on the splice, okay? So there is processing of mRNA. Ribosomes are different, as we mentioned, 70S in prokaryotes and 80S in eukaryotes. What is also interesting about this um, process is that mRNA in eukaryotes is monosestronic. What does that mean? It means that if you have three different genes, each gene is going to be transcribed into its own separate RNA. We're clear. In prokaryotes, several genes can be transcribed into one big mRNA, And prokaryotic mRNA is called polycystronic. You see the difference? Does that make sense? Yes. In eukaryotes, each gene has its own transcript. In prokaryotes, it's one large transcript polycystronic transcript that contains multiple genes. Is that clear? So, woohoo. I mean, yes. I have just, it's not important of a question, but which one of those is more likely to have errors in the whole process? Uh, so which that's a, more error prone? You mean uh, eukaryotes or prokaryotes? Yes. Uh, they're both pretty error prone. Like, there's not one that has a, a specific advantage? No. Okay. No. But if you think about it, that's actually a really good question. So first of all, RNA synthesis is not very reliable. And if you think about the role of RNA, it makes perfect sense. Think about this. If there is a mistake in mRNA, what is the outcome of that mistake? Bad protein. Now, what's going to happen to that mRNA with a mistake? Eventually. It's going to, be uh, it's going to be destroyed. Remember we talked about how this, this snapshots of recipes, this messages, how RNA is unstable. So RNA is unstable. If you get bad, bad RNA, it's okay. You know, bad protein here and there, protein gets recycled, but message is gone. So that occasional mistake 
isn't a big problem. Turns out that enzymes that make RNA, for certain reason, aren't very reliable. And that actually, uh, but if we compare eukaryotes and prokaryotes, uh, prokaryotes like bacteria, they will re reproduce much more frequently. So, in their case, the sheer number of mistakes will be more just because they reproduce frequently, just because everything is just faster. Now, that fact that RNA synthesis is much less reliable is really important implication for viruses. RNA viruses tend to accumulate mistakes in the genes really, really fast. And that explains why every year we have a new flu vaccine. We got to have a new flu vaccine. It explains why we still cannot get a vaccine for HIV. Those viruses mutate very fast. And they have RNA genomes. That makes sense? Now, one thing, uh, protein modification. Just know that protein get, proteins get modified. These modifications uh, occur mainly in eukaryotes. Bacteria, they have no Golgi complex, so there are very few protein modifications in bacteria. Which brings us <coughs> to this awesome herpes viruses. Now, huh? herpes, you know, unlike true love, stays with you forever. And um, there are three subfamilies of herpes viruses. Alpha herpes virinae, beta herpes virinae, and gamma herpes virinae. So we're going to be talking about four different representatives of the herpes virus family. Uh, herpes, sorry, five, herpes simplex and uh, chickenpox, cytomegalovirus, and these two, Epstein-Barr virus and Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. So, herpes viruses are big. They are enveloped viruses. You can see an envelope right here. They have double-stranded DNA, which is packaged in icosahedral capsid. So this capsid, you can see, is almost spherical. And the virus itself is spherical. Envelope is spherical. Herpes viruses have the largest genome among human viruses. Um, there are about 180 different genes in the herpes virus genome. Interestingly enough, we still don't know the functions of all of those genes. Now, you may see that there is a space between the capsid and the envelope. That space here is called tegument. <coughs> tegument, basically a bunch of proteins that are necessary for the successful invasion into the cell. They, proteins, in te, uh, tegument here, tegument, is necessary for invasion into the cell, okay? Tegument is necessary for the invasion into the cell. It may regulate immune response in the cell, alter cellular function different ways, shut down cellular protein synthesis, repurpose the resources, stuff like that. Um, as far as I remember, some strains of HCMV have actually 180 genes, 120 is kind of underestimate. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about terminal repeats. There are structures at the ends, terminal repeats, uh, internal repeats. The point of these structures is to regulate gene expression. And this is kind of a unique thing about herpes viruses. They have several groups of genes that are expressed at different time. They have immediate early genes that are expressed immediately or very early after the infection. Does that make sense? 
these genes will be responsible for gene expression, like transcription enzymes, okay? Tegument proteins to regulate, to shut down cellular responses to the virus. After immediate early genes, early genes are expressed. Those are the genes necessary for replicating virus DNA. And afterwards, in the very, very end, late genes are expressed. Genes that are necessary for making a virus particle. Does that make sense? If you put yourself in the place of herpes virus, it actually makes perfect sense. Virus slams into a cell. Of course, cell is not really happy about it. And it tries to shut down the virus infection. Correct? So the first thing that virus has to do is to block cellular activities. Right? Shut down the cellular immune response. That's going to be immediate early genes. Then virus has to produce certain proteins that will allow herpes virus to establish itself in the cell. Immediate early proteins. When time comes virus has to replicate its DNA. That's early genes, DNA replication enzymes. They're a little bit far. And finally, when cell is shut down, when DNA is replicated, virus can start making capsid. And those are going to be late genes. Does that make sense? Now, uh, this is the general cycle. So virus binds to the receptors. <coughs> now, this is more than you need to know. So I will be very exact what's going on. So this is herpes virus, okay? And herpes virus, whether it's HSV or CMV or EBV, binds to a receptor on the cell surface. Okay, for instance, herpes simplex and CMV, they bind to a receptor called heparin sulfate. It's a molecule. This molecule is extremely abundant and can be found on many cells. It turns out, technically speaking, herpes and CMV can infect practically any human cell. Does that make sense? Now, as you can see, the viral envelope here, it fuses with the cell membrane. So that's the fusion, releasing the capsid. Capsid eventually disassembles, releasing viral DNA, which enters the nucleus. Okay, so far, we good? It enters the nucleus. In the nucleus, there is gene expression, transcription, then viral RNA gets into the cytoplasm translation and viral proteins are used. They transport it back in the nucleus, sample capsid. Capsid gets enveloped and the mature virus is released from the cell. So basic steps are kind of, you know, they are intuitive. Virus has to get in the cell first. Fusion. Virus has to deliver its DNA in the side of in the nucleus. Here it is. DNA gets in the nucleus. By the way, why it's really a bad idea to have DNA in the cytoplasm? Let me rephrase. Is that normal for DNA molecule to be in the cytoplasm? No. no. Cell, human cell, has mechanisms that detect DNA in the cytoplasm. If they detect the DNA. What's going to happen to that cell? What it's going to do? It's going to kill itself. It's going to go in apoptosis. That's the last thing that virus wants, right? So it kind of hides DNA in the place where DNA is supposed to be, in the nucleus. Does that make sense? So DNA, genes, viral genes get expressed, you know, that stuff, transcri transcription, translation. And then proteins are used to build a new virus. And then virus picks up some membrane stuff from the cell. It can be nucleus, it can be Golgi, it can be endoplasmic reticulum. 
and it gets exocytosed. Okay? Does that make sense? What's unique about herpes viruses, as I mentioned, they stay with you forever. Because they can establish latency. Herpes viruses, all of them, they stay latent in the human cells. Okay? Now, how do they stay latent? The DNA, now, you may read some books, I don't know, I recently saw it in the AP Biology course in the high school, statement that herpes virus DNA incorporates into the chromosome. No, it doesn't incorporate into the chromosome. Herpes virus DNA, I'm going to picture it with a red, stays episomal. It forms a circle. That makes sense? And it stays in the nucleus, but it's not a part of the cellular DNA. Do you understand the difference? It doesn't get incorporated into a genome. It stays separately. It just sits in the nucleus. Does that make sense? We good? Is that understood? So it's separate. Doesn't modify hum human genome. Right? So where are those viruses establishing latency? Herpes simplex in the ganglia of sensory nerves. CMV monocytes. Epstein-Barr virus, B cells, cells of the immune system. Now, so far, we can delineate certain common features of these viruses. They all, all herpes viruses have DNA genome. All herpes viruses are enveloped. All herpes viruses can establish latency. Does that make sense? Now, in latency, herpes viruses do not replicate. They do not cause any disease. You may ask, wait a minute, what about cold sores? When your immune system gets depressed, you're stressed, you're sick, herpes virus, like HSV-1, that sits in the nerves, dorsal root ganglia, it gets reactivated, migrates in the to the exome, uh, no, retrograde, so it goes from axon towards the dendrites, okay, infects epithelial cells in your lips, and you get a cold sore. That makes sense? Once you become, like, I can expect cold sore on my lips, you know, Today or tomorrow, maybe, because I'm sick and my immune system is definitely depressed. Does that make sense? Once I'm fine, my immune system is up and running, it shuts down virus replication, cold sore is healed, it's gone. It's gone, it's gone from the cold sore, but it still stays in the neuron, yes. So, if the virus is latent yes. in the nucleus, and that cell is going through mitosis, is that still going to replicate just as well without the cold? Excellent neurons do not go through mitosis so it's going to stay there forever if we talk about monocytes and b cells yes the virus will be copied with the dna content of the nucleus so it will effortlessly spread through the population does that make sense now <clears throat> you can transmit the virus when it's reactivated the only problem that with many viruses like cmv and ebv they can get reactivated and you may not have any symptoms. So basically, it's the gift that keeps on giving. You know, you, you, just, you just produce these herpes viruses and give them to other people. Now, how these viruses are transmitted? All of them are transmitted with the bodily fluids. Meaning, urine, saliva, mainly. Kissing disease for saliva. Transmission is 
usually in the early childhood okay kids are not the most hygienic creatures whether herpes simplex or cmv or epstein bar can be transmitted through sperm is still debatable there is some evidence that cmv can be transmitted by sexual contact eh, but this evidence is a little bit foggy okay but saliva and urine or sure are we clear so two alpha herpes viruses are HSV-1, labial herpes, and varicella zoster, causative agent, very varicella, yeah, varicella zoster. VZV, causing chickenpox and shingles, okay? So let's talk about chicken pox and shingles first. Um, chicken pox is kind of unique because it also can be transmitted by a respiratory route. Okay. Uh, in primary infection, it causes chicken pox. I don't know if you ever saw anyone with chicken pox. Have you? Well, yeah, me too. When I was a kid in Russia, we do not vaccinate against chicken pox. It's not in the mandatory vaccination calendar here. Chicken pox should have been eradicated years ago because there is a vaccine. But as you all know, people do not vaccinate their kids. I'm not going to offer any comment on that. This graph here shows you the vaccine coverage in green and the number of hospitalizations. Um, from chicken pox. Yes, chicken pox may lead to hospitalizations. Chicken pox, especially in little kids or immunocompromised patients, can lead to encephalitis, which is really hard to treat. So you can see that hospitalizations are practically non-existent as vaccine coverage increases. Um, so why you should vaccinate against chicken pox? If you actually had this disease as a child, um, virus stays latent in the mainly thoracic spinal nerves. And it may reactivate later in life, usually after 55. It reactivates producing this rash. Rash is a part of a problem. It's itchy and painful. The problem is post-herpetic neuralgia. When rash is gone, when symptoms are gone, pain remains, okay? It's kind of, you know, and it may last for two to three weeks after the rash is gone. Uh, people that I know who experienced shingles said that it was, to say the least, very unpleasant experience. Now there's a vaccine against shingles that folks over 55 should take. It will boost the immunity and prevent the reactivation of the virus, okay? I want to stress that we do not have a single vaccine that is 100% effective. Shingles vaccine is pretty effective, but it's never 100%. Okay? So if somebody will tell you vaccine is bullshit because I got vaccinated and I got shingles, it's not bullshit, you just N equals 1. You just unlucky vaccine didn't work in you for some reason. But it does work and it does prevent shingles very effectively. Yes? You can get it early, but usually shingles occur in people over 55, and it makes sense to boost your immunity before you get into that risk group. That's it. Herpes. HSV-1, labial herpes. HSV-2, genital herpes. Symptomatically, no difference. In genital, you have this on the genital mucosa. So basically, the only thing why everybody, uh, you know, is so afraid of genital herpes because we're afraid to get something with our junk. Other than that, no difference. It is, as I mentioned, get latent. Okay, in immunocompetent people, get get reactivated. Stress, immunosuppression. It's a big risk factor for people with AIDS. People 
on uh, immunosuppressive therapy, like chemotherapy. Now, uh, if herpes gets in the brain, encephalitis, usually lethal, really, really um, dangerous disease. All herpes virus infections can be treated with a drug called acyclovir, okay? And mention a few things. Now, I want to finish this. I'm going to pay you back for that extra time next week, okay? I'm going to hold for a couple minutes, but it's going to be interesting. So you see that prevalence for HSV-1 increases with age, reaching practically 100% after 55. So it's already high in the beginning of life, and then it climbs up. There was a clinical study in China. That's the clinical study in Slovenia. Does that make sense? For HSV-2, uh, the prevalence is lower. So in Slovenian studies showed that about 60% of women and about 40% of men uh, have latent HSV-1, uh, HSV-2, I'm sorry. And in China, it was about 20%. So labial herpes, herpes on the lips, is really prevalent. And genital herpes isn't that much. Does that make sense? Now, um, there's no vaccine. I don't know if I have, no. Uh, but I want to say genital herpes, uh, gotcha. congenital herpes, herpes in the newborns is extremely dangerous, uh, very poor prognosis. Usually kids with uh, congenital herpes either end up uh, functionally compromised or they just don't survive. An interesting development of herpes story now is that herpes has been implicated in Alzheimer's, which contradicts all our understanding of herpes viruses uh, herpes virus was found in association with uh, amyloid proteins and tau proteins, which are hallmarks of Alzheimer's. But all herpes virologists say, if herpes is in the brain, you're dead. You don't have Alzheimer's, you're dead. So now there is a study in, in China, it goes for a while. I think they started this study in states. What they do, they take folks with Alzheimer's, and they give them a load of acyclovir, something like four or five grams a day, which is a lot. And they want to see if that treatment with anti-herpes virus drug will improve the clinical parameters in terms of, you know, cognition and things. So if I hear about some results, I'll update you on this. Okay. So I will see you next.